great to have a chance to share actually some old work, um, but uh, I think it's hopefully still interesting, even though this, this work was done uh, about 11 years ago now. Um, so I'm gonna share um, some, some work uh, from my lab on uh, phase synchronization uh, in vivo <clears throat> in the rat brain during focal seizures. Uh, and we're gonna talk about the, the underlying you know, biological physics of, uh, of the synchronization process. Um, so uh, this work, first of all, I wanna start with, with acknowledgements. Uh, this work was done together with Daisuke Takeshita. Um, this was part of his dissertation work. You can see this paper, as I said, it was old. This is from 2011. Um, and uh, he did absolutely amazing work. He was a graduate student working at the level of a postdoc, very, very gifted in the lab and theoretically, computationally. He is now a professor at the University of Tokyo. Um, so all the hard work on this, you know, um, was done uh, by, by him. So he definitely gets um, all the credit for anything interesting and in what, what I'm going to show. So uh, as I think most people in the audience probably know, um, neurons can be described as coupled noisy nonlinear oscillators. Uh, so can cardiac cells, of course. So the action potential is a threshold dependent process. Um, and you can describe um, the dynamics of, of neural activity um, with differential equations, uh, looking at the change um, of voltage uh, as a function of um, currents but the currents of course depend also on the voltage because the current depends on these voltage gated channels. And so this is kind of a schematic diagram um, that people have seen in you know, the standard Hodgkin-Huxley uh, model where you can have a circuit diagram uh, with a capacitor across the membrane and then these variable resistors. So um, you can describe neurons with you know, noisy coupled nonlinear ordinary differential, differential equations. And so just as, as examples, you can get these you know, various spiking patterns. And as you can imagine, you can look at the dynamics of that, look at the synchronization. Um, and of course that relates to the underlying neural processes, whether that's you know, um, normal healthy brain processing or something pathological. So um, in, in my group uh, and going back to some work that I did um, as a postdoc way, way back a long time ago, um, in Ted Schwartz's lab at, at Cornell, um, I've been interested in the underlying neurodynamics of seizure activity. And what happens during a seizure is a massive um, pathological amount of neural activity. So you have these noisy oscillators that are doing a pathological amount of activity. And the question is, you know, what's the underlying dynamics of that? And it's a, a problem in collective dynamics, right? Um, and so there are various ways that this can be measured. Of course, it can be modeled computationally. It has been in, in a lot of detail, but um, this can be studied, of course, experimentally. And one way you can do this is, you know, for better or worse, in vivo, in the brain of a living, deeply anesthetized animal. Um, and so I'm gonna show you experimental work from the rat brain. Uh, this is all done in the neocortex of the rat to the top, top layers of the brain. Uh, we induce what's called a focal seizure. So it, it's, it's localized. So it's not a, you know, a generalized like raw mal kind of seizure. Um, I'll tell you in the next slide how we're, you know, we're inducing it. Um, but this is just to show you um, some of the underlying dynamics and to kind of set the stage for the work that uh, Daisuke did in his dissertation. So this is um, from a paper that, you know, from back from my long ago postdoc work. Um, and this is showing uh, the region of the rat brain that we're looking at, a couple of pipettes, uh, one injecting a drug that triggers the seizures, which I'll talk about in a moment. Another one that is recording what's called the local field potential. Uh, and that's what's shown here. And the local field potential, again, a lot of people in the audience may know this, but just for completeness to make sure in case people don't, the local field potential is a recording from some region of the brain tissue, but it's not recording inside individual neurons. It's getting the signal from the extracellular um, fluid that is coming from all the neural activity, even all the glial activity, all the synaptic activity. And so it's, it's basically the 
um, you know, recording from within the tissue that's analogous to the EKG recording that you would get if you're recording a seizure, you know, in a human patient. Um, of course, the EKG signal is, is um, you know, averaging from many, many more <laughs> millions of neurons than the local field potential, but uh, it's approximately, it just conceptually, it's kind of analogous to that. So this is what the local field potential looks like. This is coming from many neurons, but it's recording from outside. So it's not recording the, you know, the delta V across the membrane um, of any individual neuron. And in this particular case, this particular type of seizure, it starts with this big spike, and then you have this repetitive pattern that can change over time, but it's, you know, this is the normal behavior before the seizure starts, and you end up with this, these very repetitive oscillations. And you've, a lot of people have probably seen this in EKG recordings from human patients. Uh, it's the same type of thing, spike and wave activity. Um, and that goes along with the, you know, um, the movement that you see, you know, uh, in, in a, a patient who's having a seizure. So one way you can image this, which is shown here, is with something called the intrinsic optical signal. And this um, is a change in the light reflectance from the brain tissue, which I'm not gonna go into in too much detail because of lack of time. Um, it's an interesting story in its own right, but this sort of imaging has a limitation. And that is that the time scale of this imaging does not match the time scale of these oscillations. So to measure this, what we're, we're doing is we have the, you know, the rat, we have a camera, we're, we're taking photographs um, with a CCD camera of the light that's reflecting from the, the tissue. And the light reflectance is gonna depend on properties like uh, blood oxygenation um, or blood volume. And that will vary depending on um, the wavelength of light that you're shining on, on the brain. Uh, and that's, uh, could go into that more in the que questions if people, um, people want to know about that. So it actually, uh, with, with orange light, it's actually analogous to what you're seeing with the bold signal, signal in fMRI, if anyone is interested in fMRI imaging. Um, but once you get those images, the change in reflectance is very, very small. So you have to do a lot of processing. And this is, you know, um, these images are um, subtracted so that we're looking at uh, the change in reflectance. And then it's put into this color scale um, where you know, uh, a greater change in reflectance, a positive change is red and negative is, is blue. So this means a greater you know, increase in reflectance. Um, and so this is telling us something about the blood volume or the blood oxygenation in the region of the brain that is experiencing the seizure. And that's very, interesting and important in terms of the underlying physiology of what's happening. And it's also very important because it can be applied in the operating room. Um, and so obviously you don't want to you know, take someone's skull off unless you have to, but um, this can actually be done you know, in a case where there's someone who has to have epilepsy surgery. And um, the idea, the long-term idea is to use this as a way to maybe localize where the seizure is coming from in order to optimize the surgical outcome. That's typically done in, in other ways. This is still, as far as I know, even many years after we did this work, uh, it's kind of in an experimental stage in terms of being used um, in human patients. But it is a type of imaging that can be done in a human subject, you know, if they happen to have to be in the operating room, if they have to, have to be going through epilepsy surgery. But if you look at the time scale, so this number is the number of the frame of the images and each frame is 600 uh, milliseconds in this particular case. And so this is frame two, frame four. And what you see is the blood volume and the blood oxygenation change, it spreads, but it doesn't oscillate because the time is, you know, the time course of this physiological signal is much slower than the under, underlying electrical dynamics. You know? And so this is really fascinating but as a nonlinear dynamicist, you know, I'm interested in what's going on with the underlying oscillations. So that's one of the things that we looked at um, when I set up my own lab at the University of Missouri, St. Louis, a um, long time ago now. Um, and so what we were doing was the same type of 
um, neocortical seizures that you saw in the intrinsic optical signal that I just showed. So these are, these are seizures induced by injecting a drug called foraminopyridine. And one of the things that it does um, is to block potassium channels. So it's basically for people who know about you know, the Hodgkin-Huxley model uh, and about um, action potentials, it's basically blocking the downstroke or inhibiting you know, the downstroke uh, of the action potentials and therefore promoting excess neural activity. And that's the presumed mechanism of how this drug induces seizures. And then we're also measuring the local field potential, LFP, um, at, at a site nearby. So this is the same thing we did you know, with this data, but now what, um, what Daisuke and I did was to repeat the experiment, but using a voltage sensitive dye. And these dyes have been developed for a while. They've also been used a lot in uh, imaging cardiac dynamics. Um, and these dyes lodge in the cell membrane and fluoresce proportional to the membrane potential. And so it's basically as if you have an electrode in every cell. Of course, with the CCD camera that we're using, the resolution is not um, showing us every single cell. So the sizes of the pixels might be comparable to the size of maybe a large neuron, but there is a lot of you know, um, diffusion of the signal. So we're seeing a lot of pixels. We're not seeing individual cells, but we are seeing this somewhat smooth, somewhat diffused signal that at least is gonna have the time scale of the voltage oscillations. So it's not exactly having an electrode inside every cell and getting that recording from every single neuron, but it's a lot closer than the intrinsic optical signal. These dyes though are toxic. And so, um, you know, there's a limitation here. We can get interesting data from, you know, rats in vivo, but this is something that cannot, at least not at this point, be used, you know, in, in human patients. So of course th there's trade-offs for everything, of course. So, um, so we stain the brain with this dye, and here's a little bit more about the procedure. I can go into the experimental details afterwards if people are interested. Um, we're using what was a state-of-the-art CCD camera when I had my startup funds, <laughs> which is a, a while ago now. Um, and of course, the camera has to be synced with the lo local field potential recording. There's a lot of other experimental detail. Um, there's a heart monitor. The rat actually has to be intubated so that you can remove the breathing artifact. And so Daisuke, you know, while getting his PhD in physics was also learning how to intubate rats. So he, you know, he graduated with a very wide range of expertise. Um, and so what, what the signal looks like is you have the local field potential, you have these oscillations. Um, and then here's the voltage sensitive dye signal. And you can see that the voltage sensitive dye signal. And again, when I say the signal, we're looking at the percentage change in fluorescence of the dye. So there's, you take the images and there's a lot of processing. You know, you have to do the image subtraction um, after the artifacts are, are removed. We're doing you know, filtering, um, removing artifacts. Um, so a lot goes into the, the data processing there, of course. But so, um, once we have this signal and we do all of the processing, you, you can see that it's still noisy, but we have these oscillations. And you can see that they, they match the local field potential. And this voltage sensitive dye signal is taken from a region of interest that's near the electrode where we're recording um, the local field potential. So if the VSD signal, it correlates with the local field potential then we can basically assume that the VSD signal elsewhere in the neocortex is going to be telling us what the local field potential electrode would be telling us if we had a local field potential electrode at all those other points um, in, in the neocortex. So basically, the voltage sensitive dye is a pretty good proxy for the local field potential. And so we're basically getting a recording of these oscillations across the entire neocortex. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, I, sh I should say, I mean, th we, this is from our data verifying this is working. Lots of other people have used the same kind of dye and verified that it does this you know, in, in 
various other um, systems. So once we have these oscillations, we want to look at um, whether there is synchronization between the oscillations. So how is the oscillation, you know, in one region of the neocortex correlated with some other region in the neocortex? Uh, so basically, if you go back, you know, what's the time course here with respect to the time course here? Are they synchronized uh, or not? What, what's what the time, um, the time uh, relationship? And so I, I know that I'm, I'm getting a little bit short on time here, so I will, you know, go as quickly as possible and get at least to uh, some of the, the key results. Um, so the, way, what, the thing we're interested in looking at is the phase difference between these oscillations. So what, what does that mean? Um, so if we're looking at neural spikes, so say this is, this is from a simulation, we have one neuron that's firing at times TK and TK plus one, and another neuron that's firing at TI, TI plus one. The phase difference is gonna be calculated like this. So we look at this time interval, if you can see my cursor, divided by this time interval, and then multiplied by two pi. So we're basically, basically thinking of one of these oscillators as a standard and every time it fires, we'll say that's one cycle. And we're looking at the timing of the other one uh, with respect to this um, standard cycle. So if we look at the phase difference, uh, then you can calculate what's called the synchronization index that is basically a measure of how relatively constant the phase difference is. And this is important because it's not measuring whether they are firing at the same time, but it's measuring whether there's a relatively fixed time interval between the firings. And so with this synchronization index, you would get, uh, you could get a number um, close to one if they're perfectly synchronized, but 180 degrees out of phase as well as if they're perfectly synchronized and exactly in phase. So this is not measuring, it's not gonna capture only are they exactly in phase. Hopefully that makes sense. And that's, that's why this, this, um, this approach, which is called stochastic phase synchronization is a really powerful approach because it will give you this you know, measure um, which, which allows for stochasticity in the data, which of course you'll have in, in real biological data. And it also allows for um, out of phase synchronization as well as perfectly in phase synchronization. And this method was developed um, a couple of decades ago. Uh, it's discussed a lot in, there's a book by Rosenblum, Pukowski and Kurtz, and it's discussed by a number of other people who collaborated with them. Uh, so this has been used in a lot of biological um, data sets uh, already. So um, of course, we have a problem here. We don't have nice clear spikes in, in our voltage sensitive dye signal. So what we have to do is add another step. We have to actually calculate the phase of, of the signal um, at each pixel, at each time point using a Hilbert transform. That will give us the phase uh, at each signal. Uh, and from that, we can calculate the phase difference. And so once we have the phase from the Hilbert transform, then we can again calculate this uh, synchronization index which will give us the measure of um, how, how well different pairs of pixels are synchronized. So now let me quickly get to some results. So what we can do is to look at phase differences between different pairs of um, pixels as a function of time. So here's the local field potential measured at the center here. And we're, we see this um, getting to be a much, much larger signal. This is time in seconds. This is as the seizure progresses. So if you expand this, you'd see those you know, rapid spikes. And these traces are the uh, synchronization index measured with a sliding time window. So we're averaging, but over a window that's moving forward. So you can get the synchronization index as a function of time. And what you see is the synchronization index goes up at the beginning of the seizure stays very high and then goes down as the seizure ends. 
Uh, also, the synchronization index gets higher for uh, these pixels that are closer to where the um, local field potential is, is being recorded. Um, that is also where, um, or, or almost exactly where, the formidopyridine was, was injected. So nearer to the site of the seizure onset, uh, the synchronization index gets higher, um, but it still does go up in these regions farther away. So I know I'm getting very close to time here. So let me show, show you uh, a few other summary um, slides. So we don't want to just look at you know, selected pairs of pixels. We want to look at the entire area of the neocortex. And that's what's shown here. So this is showing the synchronization index color scale from zero to one at all different uh, points within the neocortex over time. And this is time in seconds uh, with the, the number down here. And so you see that you know, everywhere the synchronization index goes up, stays high, and then goes down. So here we are recording these you know, fast oscillations. And this is, this is not like the intrinsic optical signal, um, something that just goes up and stays. It's something that goes up and stays up, but it's based on the underlying fast time dynamics of the actual neural activity. And so this is showing the mean synchronization index averaged over all these pairs of pixels with respect to um, this reference pixel near um, the injection site. And that's going up, staying up, and going down. And here's another example. This is uh, from, from a different seizure in a different rat. You can see that the different areas, um, you know, it kind of starts in two different regions and then merges. But again, the average synchronization index goes up. Um, and so if you look at this over um, a number of seizures, the average synchronization index before the seizure is statistically significantly less than the average synchronization index during the seizure. And so the big take home from this as I get to um, 10.56, my time, so I, I will be wrapping up. Um, the, the take home message is that there is an increase in synchronization across the neocortex as the seizure spreads. And this actually has been, or had been at the time that we were investigating this, an open question. There, there's, some, there's some data that suggests that there might actually be a drop in synchronization at the beginning of a seizure. And so this kind of you know, plays into uh, kind of a longstanding debate about what the underlying dynamics are as a seizure spreads. Um, you can also look at the relative phase difference at the different pixels, but I think I'm going to skip over this because I'm, you know, I don't want to go over time here. Uh, so the overall conclusions uh, fr from this work, first of all, you know, we find that voltage sensitive dye imaging does allow us to see the statistically sig significant increase in synchronization in these in vivo seizures in the rat. Um, a lot of open questions remain. Uh, the phase relationships, how they change during seizure spread, um, particularly do they change from the onset to the termination? Uh, how, how do they change from one region uh, of the neocortex to another? And then uh, another question that's, that's very important is how does this play into designing mechanisms for disrupting pathological synchronization? Uh, including development of implantable devices. How could this be used to design ways to break up pathological synchronization? And that is being done using this type of approach now uh, by people like Peter Tass at Stanford, uh, who is working on this type of problem, but in breaking up uh, Parkinsonian uh, pathological synchronization, um, which is based on neural circuits that are um, a lot more stereotyped and better, better understood. You know, the onset of seizures happens in so many different ways in, in human patients that it's a much more complicated problem. Not that, not that dealing with Parkinson's synchronization is not an uh, incredibly complicated problem, but there's so many different ways that seizures can uh, start in human subjects that developing mechanisms for breaking them up uh, becomes a much more complicated problem. 
So these are some of the open questions. Um, and just wanna acknowledge uh, support from uh, NSF and the Epilepsy Foundation. And with that, I think I'm definitely out of time. So I will stop and be glad to take questions. Thank you, Sonia, for a wonderful talk. Uh, so I don't see any questions. Audience members, if you have any questions for Sonia, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask directly. So I guess while the audience is thinking, Sonia, I have a quick question and maybe I missed this. So now that you have some idea about the onset of, of this process of Schizers, can you also make some predictions about precursors, like you know when you might expect you know, these kinds of events to happen? So possibly, um, we have not seen any underlying changes in the dynamics that seem to be a predictor. Mm -hmm. um, the, a lot of a lot of groups are working on that. I mean, uh, you know, for obvious <laughs> obvious reasons, clinically as well as this, the dynamical interest. Um, other than the. In, in, in these four amino pyridine um, seizures, other than that big spike that you see at the beginning, but that's not really a precursor, that's, that's the start, you know. Um, we have not seen any changes in like a slow building change in synchronization or a drop in synchronization. So that's definitely something that is a really important question. And we haven't found any precursors. Um, of course, there are, there are, you know, there's a whole series of um, studies that could be designed specifically to look for that with this type of technique. And we've really just looked in the data sets that we have, you yeah. know. Um, so very important question. We don't have any, any sign of precursors, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But, Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right. Okay.